Uh, I've been a part of a lot of different types of uh, digital branding campaigns and strategies, so uh, we're going to talk about a few of those today. But really just going to want to walk you through a little bit of our secret sauce that when we're putting together a campaign, this is the process we go through to make sure that it's going to be set up and designed to be successful. But um, anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing that we do when we're going to look at building a, a digital branding campaign or a branding campaign in general is understanding the media landscape. Uh, we need to know if we're going to build a branding campaign to reach consumers or potential consumers, where are we going to uh, build this campaign at? So, uh, understand the media landscape. Number one is to basically, you can find a lot of different resources and free things online. So, if you type in con uh, consumer time spent with media, we want to get an understanding of how do people and consumers spend their time. We're going to build a branding campaign on what channels, what media do we want to build it, and where is the right way to find these people. So if you Google time spent with media and you scroll down here is an eMarketer article. We find eMarketer is pretty credible and uh, gives us some good information. And although it's a little bit you know, number heavy here, this will show you over the past several years, since 2010, how consumers have spent their time with various media. You can see that digital is uh, 47%, TV at 36 uh, radio right around 11 and so forth. So this tells you how consumers spend their time and how they've done this and how it's changed over time. You can see digital has grown every single year since 2010 and I think even before that while other media has decreased as well. Now, within digital, you can see that mobile has grown substantially and has really taken the majority of consumers' time, which is not surprising since some of you are taking notes on your phone right now. So if we want to understand, again, how to build a branding campaign and reach consumers and tell them your story, this is where they're spending their time with their media. So it really makes us understand how we're going to start putting this together. So now that we understand that digital is where consumers spend their time, we also know that this impacts how advertisers invest those dollars to reach those consumers. So if we want to understand where people are investing those dollars to adequately reach these consumers in these channels, then we want to take a look at another source. So if you go back to Google and you type in uh, annual internet ad spending, you're going to find a free resource at the IAB. It's the Internet Advertising Bureau. And again, there's a lot of great reports here, and we're going to look at a few pages of them. Uh, but they have these uh, full half-year and quarterly reports uh, that have several, several pages. But we're just going to take a look at a few of these uh, out of it. So I encourage you to take a look at this and, and get as much information as you'd like. What you can see here is that while consumers spend most of their time with digital media, it certainly reflects how advertisers invest those dollars to reach them. So now, Internet has surpassed all other advertising media uh, to become the largest invested in channel uh, or media uh, available today. So it is number one. Uh, among all the other channels. So this is the first time I think last year that this happened and reflects again now investing is starting to uh, mirror what consumers are actually doing. But within the internet there's obviously a lot of different ways to invest those dollars because it's a big space, there's a lot of things, you know, is it pay-per-click, is it organic, is it display, uh, and it's all those things. So uh, a little bit earlier in the report you can see how these are broken out. This is the full 2013 year of how internet ad spending was invested. And you can see that 43% was in search. This is paid and organic. Uh, then there's display, mobile, and so forth. Uh, we're going to take a look at this a little bit deeper uh, as we move on. But you know, this search area, this 43%, the reason people love all that with digital media is because that's your low funnel, right? That's your, your low-hanging fruit. That's your hand raisers that are already in the market searching for your products and services right now. But the rest of this, for the most part, uh, mobile, banner, uh, you've got digital video, you've got rich media, you've got sponsorship. It's all branding elements of digital media, right, or internet ad spending. So understanding how we incorporate not only the low funnel action-oriented campaigns, but also that mid-upper funnel branding is important for us. So that's how we're going to take a look at how we build some of these campaigns. Now, not only is it important to understand how to build branding into this, but we also understand that when we're looking at this, one of the things we found interesting uh, last year was Facebook came out with a deck and one of the pages on it was from March 2014 that started to help us understand why paid search and organic search and low funnel is not the only way to go. Some of this data is a little bit old, so I'm going to just have a disclaimer here. We're working on more fresh data ourselves, but this story is still the same. What this says is that in the fourth quarter of 2012, 115 million searches were conducted for shoes online. However, in fourth quarter of 2012, 784 million shoes were purchased. So that tells you that not everybody who purchased shoes searched for them online. Now that sounds pretty obvious to those that don't purchase shoes online, but in digital marketing and digital media, everybody wants to focus on this area right here because it's measurable, it's trackable, it shows you your ROI, and it's very, very finite, very black and white on where your dollars are. But 
115 million searches, yet 740, 84 million shoes purchased. So how do we impact all this area right here? Branding, right? I mean, there's other ways, but for the most part, branding. We have to make sure that we're doing more than just this low funnel acquisition. So that's why we're talking about some of this stuff today. So, now that we understand the media landscape, we understand digital and how internet has changed and consumer uh, media usage has changed uh, and why we can't focus exclusively on the low funnel of digital marketing. Now we talk about how do we build this campaign, right? So step one, uh, well, I guess step two, is understanding now your goals and KPIs. You know, too often we actually talk to advertisers that don't know why their website exists in the first place. I mean, we actually sit across with people and say, well, why does your website exist? And it's like, well, you just kind of have to have one, don't I? I was like, well, no, you don't have to have one. I mean, you should have one, and you should know why. So, let's use an example of understanding what your website's for. Uh, we work with uh, Bigby Coffee, and most of you know uh, this organization and what they do, but they didn't call us to help them sell coffee. They're doing all right with some of that right now. They called us because they're looking to help grow more coffee franchises and franchisee owners on the southeast side of Michigan. So, what they were interested in, not as people that go get coffee, but people looking for franchise opportunities, investors, you know, which is even more difficult, the B2B space, right? So how are we going to help them? What is their website for, and what can we glean from a successful visit to this website? So, what we said is the goal or KPI, or key performance indicator, uh, is what KPI stands for. The KPI for this campaign, this advertiser, is those who fill out this form and hit submit. That is the best thing, the closest thing to the cash register that we can get for Big B Coffee here, right? This is the most important thing. Secondly, emailing this right here or calling this phone number, both of which can be tracked. So this is what we call macro conversions. When we're looking at goals or KPIs of your website, we want to know what are the most important things and what are the next most important things. Macro conversions are the most important things that happen on your website. If you have an e-commerce site, a transaction is a macro conversion. You know, and if you don't have an e-commerce site, what is the closest thing that you can consider a transaction? It's these things. But what leads to a transaction? What leads to a macro conversion? Well, people who download a brochure, or click on this fax, or discover Bigby, or ask Bob a question, all of these things tell us that this, this visitor, this user, is more interested, more likely to convert to become a franchisee uh, owner than those who just visit the website. <laughs> So we're trying to basically prioritize the traffic to the site and what's important to this advertiser. So if we know what's important, this is what we know what we're trying to accomplish. If you're investing dollars in branding, this is why you're doing it. It's not just to get traffic to the site. It's not just because you have to or should. It's to make something happen. So what are we trying to make happen? We're trying to make macro and micro goals happen. And once you understand that, now we can start talking about how we're going to bring traffic to that website and we're going to make more of these things happen because that's what's going to be successful and generate a return on your dollar. So the first thing we look at if we're going to try and get traffic to the website is where we're going to bring that traffic in from. Our geotargeting, geography. So you might ask yourself, well, how do I target? You probably already know where your customers are, where your prospects are, are located, but we often look at Google Analytics. Most of you are probably, I mean, raise your hands if you are using Google Analytics on your website right now. All right. So some of you are probably familiar with this information here. So how do we know where our geography is? Well, you can take a look at Google and break down your geography by your metro and your market and figure that out. And it actually allocates your percentage of where the traffic's coming from. So you could geotarget similarly to the way your traffic's already coming in now. If 17% and most of your traffic is coming in from Detroit, there's probably a lot of other people in Detroit that are not visiting your website that might be interested in visiting that website. So this might be a good place to brand. Also in Grand Rapids, Flint, Saginaw Bay City, and so forth, from this example here. Um, and again, you can prioritize that however you like. This is just based on traffic. You know, you can prioritize that based on, uh, this is based on number of sessions. You can prioritize it based on new traffic, uh, your quality and your bounce rate. Or even better yet, goal completions and conversions. So if you know that even though Detroit has more traffic coming, but Traverse City converts a lot better, well, Traverse City might be a higher priority for you to target your geo. So understanding how you prioritize your markets and how you're going to allocate your budgets to those markets is important. Today we're going to focus primarily just based on population, but know that we put a lot of different factors in, and in fact we've got some that are really complicated that, that calculate traffic conversions, uh, you know, uh, some different uh, goal completions and CRM data, 
uh, we take in some other things and other factors that start to really figure out what is the priority market for us and how do we go after this. So for the sake of example, we're going to just basically use uh, geography and population today. So hypothetically speaking, we're going to geo-target uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, Grand Rapids, and Detroit, all in the same area. So we're going to figure out, well, okay, that's based on my analytics, or if you don't know, you're going with your gut. Uh, you can do it based on revenue, number of stores, or whatever that is. But really what you want to find out is just get a barometer for how you're going to build this. So really what you want to know is populations of these areas. So if you're looking for populations, again, go online, type in market populations. You're going to find a number of sources. There's Nielsen data, there's Arbitron data, and again, it doesn't really matter that it's perfect and exact, it just helps you get a barometer for how much to put where. And so here is some Nielsen data that can tell us in Chicago. We've got approximately 8 million people uh, in that market. And again, we don't need to be exact, but it can help us just figure out if we're going to allocate some budgets where to put these things. In Detroit, uh, we've got approximately 4 million people in Detroit. Uh, then we have Milwaukee. Where are we at? Milwaukee. 1.5 million. And in Grand Rapids, according to Nielsen data, 800,000. Now, if I recall in the math in my head, which I'm not that good at, uh, this is 14.3 million people. Okay? So you got 14, you're actually going after a market of 14.3 million people. So how much do you put into Chicago versus, you know, Grand Rapids versus Milwaukee or whatever? Well, we're just going to do some math. Um, you know, here to figure that out. So 8 divided by your 14.3 tells us that we should put 56% in Chicago. And again, not an exact science, but this tells us a way to start. 4 divided by your 14.3 tells us that we could put 28% in Detroit. 1.5 divided by your 14.3. 10, 11% here. And your 800,000 divided by 14.3. Right around 6%. Okay? So this gives you just an approximation of where to get started. It's not perfect, um, but it's a way to get going. Because otherwise, if you just start targeting things, well, Chicago's going to soak up all your budget. Right? I mean, and, and it may not be your, your best market. And in analytics, you're always going to see things like New York and, and L.A. are coming in and, and bringing in a lot of traffic because there's a lot of IP addresses coming from there. They may not be your highest priority markets. So sometimes you can eliminate those markets and focus on the ones that do matter to you and then allocate these budgets here. But we also want to make sure that we don't just stick within these areas here and, and hyper-target our, our places we, because we know IP addresses are not perfect and we know that there are some people we're missing. So what we try to do is go with a layered approach. You know, we kind of layer things to test what's working and what's not and how we can shift between things. So number one is what we would say is like your local target, right? If I target just like this, that's kind of a local strategy on how I can get each of these markets pretty granular. So then what is our, our regional target? You know, if I group all these areas together, that's our regional target. Or if I even expand a few others in there, what if I added in, you know, uh, South Bend, or if I added in Indianapolis or Fort Wayne, you know, this is a regional target. And I group all those things together to see how that performs. And then number three is what I would consider kind of that, you know, that, that mass, you know, you know, mass, but here you might say it's the Midwest. You know, if your business is willing to go to Wisconsin and Illinois and Indiana and Ohio to do business, well, maybe that's your your Midwest or your, your more mass target. So these three areas, if you design a campaign to go after all three of these areas at once, you can start to identify what's working and what's not. If you're only going to focus this way, what happens if Fort Wayne, Indiana is a hot market for you? You wouldn't know, right? Until something in analytics started to tell you, but you're not investing there at all. This is going to help you make sure that you're reaching most of the people, you're strategic about it, and you can make better decisions about that moving forward. Now, some of you might be saying, but I don't need to reach the Midwest. You know, I reach people in my backyard. So I would say you can think about this even more granularly. But in your case, if you're thinking that way, you're thinking, well, I zip target to a small radius around my store. Well, that's great, but that's this. Okay, If that's your zip target around your store, awesome, do that. But again, you're missing a lot of people based on those IP addresses. So what's your bigger plan? What's your bigger plan? So have a layered approach, even if it's not Midwest, regional, and, and a collection of large markets. Make sense? So now that we know kind of where we're going to find these people, we need to know who we're going after. So that reads in and gets us into our audience targeting a little bit, which is a little more difficult because you may not know exactly who your audience is outside of you know, your gut instinct on who those people might be. 
which often is not uh, the best way to go. Sometimes you have CRM data that tells you this. Sometimes you have um, you know, prism targets you've created from uh, different sources. You've used Axiom or whatever that might be. Um, so you use all the information you can uh, to find out who your audience is. But here's the way we go about audience targeting. You know, branding, a lot of times we think of this mass marketing, right? We think of, uh, and I used to work in radio, but you think television, you think radio, you think billboards, you're reaching a mass market, um, oftentimes with very little targeting. Some, but rather minimal targeting to a branding mass marketing campaign. So this is the approach here. While digital has taken the very opposite approach, unfortunately, has gone very hyper-targeted. You know, and we often joke that it's the left-handed volleyball player who's a mom who wears a pink sweater and drives a Toyota Sienna and lives in Ionia County. Like, that is all possible things to target. And that is what people love about digital media, but it's not the right way to go. So reaching this mass market is not the best way to do it, but also neither is reaching this one person. So similarly to what we're doing here with Geo, we do the same thing with audience. Okay, and here's an example of that. Meyer came to us a couple years ago, and we work with them often, but they had said they wanted to reach women 2554, primary household shopper with 100,000 plus household income. Right? It was like, okay, all right, all right, we'll do your campaign. Uh, but then what we started to notice is that we said, what if we just went women 2554 and dropped the household income and primary household shopper? That's, you know, difficult to see this blue area here, but this is kind of our mid-range, a little bit broader target. We actually saw a performance increase. So by loosening a little bit of our targeting and allowing some other people to be receiving that message, we saw better performance. So that was here. Then we said, well, if that's the case, what if we just went women? And we actually saw better performance there as well. Now that's not always the case. It's not always going to be that the less you target, the better your campaign is. But we wouldn't have known that if we weren't doing this layered approach. So what I would suggest again, just like geography is, who's your hyper target? Narrow that down. Focus on it. I mean, left-handed volleyball players, pink sweaters, Toyota Siennas with kids in Ionia County, right? Find out who that is for your business. Probably not those people. Um, and we still have never targeted those people, but I'm interested to see if we could. Uh, and then secondly, who is your broader audience? You know, so again, think about that. Who is your hyper-target? Who is the people most likely to be like those people? And then who is your mass market? Because we want influencers of your business, too. Not just the people who might purchase or shop for your goods and services, but those who might tell others to do it. So that's theory. And again, now you can start to monitor your campaigns by audience to see where should I invest my dollars more. What areas are working better, what audiences are working better, and start giving you better decisions on how to make your campaigns perform uh, and maximize your return. So now that we know where those people are, we know who those people are, we know those people are using multiple devices, right? They're using laptops, desktops, uh, still in some cases. They're using uh, iPads and iPhones and everything else. So how do we reach those people across multiple devices? Because we can't just target one. Well, again, in analytics, it'll tell you how the traffic is already coming to your website. And this is one way to mirror your campaign. In this example, you know, desktop is 74%, mobile, 14, tablet, 11. That's how the traffic's already coming to this website. Perhaps you should mirror that and reach people in that same way. Um, but you also want to consider uh, the experience that your consumers have. I mean, if you don't have a mobile site and you've got a lot of traffic coming into mobile, like you might want to consider having a mobile site. And keep that in mind as you're going through this. You might also want to consider not ignoring your branding campaign on, on mobile or tablet experience for that while you're working on that, but keep in mind you know, how that's going to impact the quality of your traffic and the conversions you have. Okay, um, So you always want to reach people where they are. I would never say that you shouldn't use you know, mobile if you don't have a mobile site. I think you should be working on your mobile site if you don't already have one. Uh, but this, again, is where people are. So we want to be in front of where people are. But at the same time, not only can we use this as a way to figure that out and have a strategy for how we're going to reach those multiple devices, uh, but you can also take a look at some of the information we looked at before as well uh, from the IAB. So if you go back to that Internet Advertising Bureau uh, annual ad spending report, it has a lot of information in there. Um, and one of those is a little bit of that information we took a look at earlier. We already know how advertisers are investing in mobile, and we know how they're investing in banners and desktop. So we can use that as a way to figure out how much goes into each of those as well. But if we're going to start to figure out, this leads us into the next one, which is ad type. You know, how much mobile do we do? How much desktop do we do? Standard display do we do? Rich media do we do? Video, how much of that goes into there? Because these are all areas we should be investing in, uh, but we want to do this strategically. So this tells us, and this is just a, a more current uh, look at the same pie chart we looked at earlier. 
which says that 39% is in search, organic search, paid search, pay-per-click right here. And really, uh, the rest here is uh, mobile, which is now grown to 23% of all online ad spending, uh, and 17% in banners and display, 6% uh, in video, 6% uh, is lead generation, which again is that low funnel, so that's not our branding campaign. But you've got uh, rich media at three and sponsorship at two. Okay, so if we really add up all of our ad types in our uh, in our branding campaign, oops, not me. And we're going to figure out how much of this we're going to put into which ad type. So if you look at mobile, the interesting part here about mobile is that of this 23%, only 47% is in display. The other 51% is in search, so that's the low funnel for search or for mobile, right? So if we take 47% of our 23%, now we know that about 11% uh, is really going to be a mobile portion of the campaign. Now we know that this right here, this uh, banner advertising, um, is is all branding, so you can add that in at 17. Uh, then you've got your digital video in here at 6, and then you've got rich media at 3, Media three, then you get sponsorship at what two, which equals thirty nine percent. Thirty nine percent is in low funnel, and there's a little bit in your lead generation and classifieds. Thirty nine percent is in these branding elements of your campaign as well. So now, if we say these are the areas that we would like to invest in, you know, how much do I put into each of these areas here? Make sure that I'm strategic about that as well. So the same kind of math we were doing here over here with our geography, we're going to do for our ad types. So if you've got 11 percent, you know, going into mobile divided by your 39, you can put 28 percent into mobile, exclusively mobile. 17 divided by 39, all 44 percent. Video, I think it's 15 percent. Yeah. Media, seven, eight percent. So this is a way to allocate ad types, but it's also based on kind of a little bit on device, how much you're going to invest in as well. Just make sure that you're adequately reaching the market, but you're also incorporating high impact and some engagement campaign uh, portions of your campaign as well. Now I understand not every budget is going to be allowed to, to go across all these, so you have to prioritize those as well. Because if you start to break down your budget and you have like one dollar going to sponsorship, well perhaps we should eliminate that. You know, so keep this in mind as you go for it. But this will tell you how to how to put this together. And I also like it because based on the way that advertisers are investing this, is kind of a reverse on the on the cost per per unit, right? So these are typically your cheaper units. So you can use you know more of your cheaper units to maximize your reach. You know, mobile is probably second. Same kind of thing. So we're now starting to shift less of our investment to some of the higher cost you know, units like video. <laughs> video is grown, but rich media, these are some higher cost units. So it's a nice way to make sure that you're bringing in some of these expensive ad units that have high engagements, but you're not putting all your dollars there uh, and counting on those things to perform for you. So this is just a way to make sure that you're reaching all those different ad types. So now you know where you're going to reach people, uh, and you have a layered approach to that. You know who those people are, and you have a layered approach to that. You know what device they're going to be on, and you're reaching them across multiple devices. And you know what ad type you're going to put in front of them, so that not only you can maximize reach, but you can maximize engagement and impact on those people too. So you can generate a response to get to what? Macro and micro goal conversions, right? So now this really has been our strategy. This is developed. Once you've figured out all these things, you have a strategy. If you plug a number into the budget overall, you're going to have a fall right here and figure that out. And you can allocate your percentages here too. It could be a third, a third, a third, however you want to do this. You know. But now you plug your budget in, you've got your strategy, you're ready to go, you know what you're trying to accomplish, and you know how to hold yourself and your media partners accountable. Right? So this is really the campaign. Next is how you're going to say, well, how do I monitor campaign performance, and how do I know that this is working? Well, you already know if it's working or not, because you've already established goals and KPIs that tell you what you're trying to accomplish. That's why you're investing dollars, that's what you're looking to get. Now, in analytics, I would say the best thing you can do to monitor campaign performance is to connect your goals and KPIs and to set those goal completions and goals in, uh, in analytics, set up events in analytics to track those things so you can see when they happen. And there's a whole separate webinar on how you can connect your analytics to your media campaign through UTM codes and other things. But 
you can connect those to your marketing campaigns and see how those things are working and what areas of this is working better than others. But even before that, you want to work with your media and say, how is the media working overall? So you want to see some basic things from your, your media partners or from the, the systems and technologies you're using, such as impressions and clicks and CTRs. This is the most basic form of how you're going to measure a campaign. Um, but it's not good enough. It doesn't tell you enough about that story. It says, did they see my ad? Did they click my ad? And did they do that better or, or less than, than average? So that's going to tell you something. But if you're using things like rich media or, or video or things like that, you're going to want to see engagements over time. If you're running a video campaign, what's the video completion rate? How many of them saw the 100% of the video? When did they drop off? Why did they drop off? You know, how can I adjust my video to get people to stay and watch longer? Should I do a shorter video? You know, like these are things they're going to tell you. How are the engagement metrics and any interactions across this campaign? You know, and what's this telling you about how people are consuming this video and how they're how they're converting from it, how they're engaging with it. Um, where are they coming from? <clears throat> Again, you've already set up your geotargeting campaign. Where are you seeing them from? This is tracking impressions. You can also track views. You can track clicks and some different things. So as much data as you can get about how you're monitoring your campaign and how it's performing against this camp this strategy you set up is important. Uh, you know, and then there's other metrics too. We use a lot of other things in addition to just this here, but you know, what is the viewability on a campaign? What is the interaction rate on a campaign? Where are they clicking? How often are they clicking? Um, are they doing view through completions? Did they see the ad, not click it, but later show up on your website? These are all important pieces to tell us that story of how is this working? Is it working? And what pieces of it are working? You know, because that's what the beauty of digital marketing is, that it's going to show you data on your campaign from yesterday to make decisions today that are going to positively impact your, your strategy for the month. And it continues to do that. It's going to show you what pieces are working better, what pieces are not working, so you can adjust. Because this is just a starting point. Any strategy you develop is going to change by the time you get going with it. Because you're going to start to identify those goals and KPIs and what's working and what's not. So you're going to want to make sure that you're monitoring not only your analytics, you're connecting that to understand goal completions and conversions, and then you're looking at all the data possible to see what pieces of that are working and what's not. That's how you're going to monitor that campaign performance. Some tips that we use on how we monitor a campaign is we check pacing daily, which means I'm looking to serve a number of impressions every day. So I want to make sure I'm serving those impressions. Are they being served? Like, that's daily. Are they being served, and are they serving the right amount? If we're not, then we might need to adjust some of these things so that we can serve the impressions we're looking to serve. Um, and, you know, weekly, we'll look at performance. What are these engagement metrics looking like? Every week, are we seeing good things happen? We don't make adjustments every week, but we watch the performance every week to see are they engaging like we'd like them to do. And then we take a look every other week or once a month for sure at optimizations. So what am I going to change? What am I going to change about this strategy? Now let's not change at all because you won't know what's working and what's not. But what am I going to change about this to make a better campaign? And that's how you're going to monitor your campaign performance. But finally, you know, you can do all this stuff yourself through a lot of different tools. Um, or you can select a, a partner. So what are the things that you're going to do to select a partner that's going to help you do some of these things? You know, that's always the challenge, right? Everybody sells advertising, everybody sells digital, and everybody has an impression, and everybody's got an opinion, right? So what are you going to do? I would suggest you find a true marketing partner for you, okay? To me, it's important, and we say this internally, and I say this externally. To me, in this business, there are three types of people in sales for this business. Media salespeople. They're the ones who bring the ranker to you, they're the ones that bring the numbers to you, and they're the ones that talk about the size of their audience and how you've got to buy it. Anybody who sells media and works in a media company is a media salesperson. And they're probably not the best person to help you. There are also marketing consultants, which are a little step above that, who understand how to use media to create marketing campaigns. And sometimes really good marketing campaigns. But they still are limited there because they don't understand your business. So the third layer of people are the ones you really want to find are the business partners. You know, a true business partner who understands what return on investment looks like to you. What is an average sale? What is the length of a sale? Where are things converting? What are your revenue streams? What are your other revenue streams? You know, what is the profit margin? You know, how should I adjust things to make sure that we're doing this? What are the goal completions? How does a goal turn into a profit to a transaction? How does a transaction equate to? What is the return on investment? All these things are things that your true business partner should be asking and looking for and to help you. Because maximizing that, that, connecting that marketing dollar invested to the cash register is the most important thing and the most intangible thing to do with brand, right? So look for a true marketing partner, somebody who you trust, you know, but also somebody who has access to the right technology. 
And branding, what we say is that we're always trying to make sure we do four things better than everybody. Number one, find the right people. If you can't find people, then you can't brand and serve them a message. So if you're not able to find the right people, then you can't do it the best. So in order to find the right people, and I know this is really confusing, it's making some of your heads spin, uh, and it certainly has taken me a few years to not get dizzy when I look at it. But what this is telling us is it's uh, basically just the, the environment to purchase and sell uh, you know, impressions or basically inventory for our branding campaigns. But number one is to find the right people, you should work with somebody who has a data management provider. All right, it's a DMP. It's basically the way that you target people. It's the way you get data to target the right people. You want to find that left-handed volleyball player and with a pink sweater driving the Toyota Sienna minivan who lives in Iowa County, you're going to use a DMP. All right, ours right here is low to me, and that's the DMP that we use. There are several others. It's not the only one to use, but if you want to find the right people and target the right people, the only way to do it is through good first-party and third-party data. So a DMP helps you do that. But it's only going to help you find people. It won't help you serve those people in ads across those multiple devices and those geographies and so forth. So you also need uh, access to the inventory which is where this DSP comes into play, a demand-side platform. I know we're getting a little nerdy, but again, in order to find the right people, we have to serve them an ad. So we serve them an ad using AppNexus. Again, there's a lot of other DSPs. It's not the only one. Um, you can certainly use a lot of others. We use AppNexus because it directly connects to the inventory exchange and allows us to serve up to 90% of all online ad inventory. So when you're looking to reach people in Grand Rapids or Chicago, a DSP will have the inventory access to do it. And it's going to work with a DMP to help us find the right people. Okay? So those are just a couple of the technologies you want to make sure that your partner has and that they're also using those things. Because you want smart people with smart technology. And beyond these two things in terms of finding people and finding inventory, you want to make sure that you can monitor you know, the campaign. So, like we talked about a bit ago, find somebody who has more than impressions and clicks and CTRs. You know? Find a person who's going to bring you reporting and talk to you about your campaigns that are more than impressions and clicks and CTRs. And if they're not, and in some cases we continue to challenge our own people to do this too, challenge them, push them, because impressions and clicks and CTRs are not going to tell you how your goals and KPIs are doing and how you're going to generate a return on your branding campaign. So challenge those people and look for people who bring you enhanced analytics beyond just what you would expect from a digital campaign and tell you what that story is and how it's performing. So look for somebody with some different things like that. And finally, you want to look for somebody you trust. You know, digital marketing is a scary place. It's a confusing place. And there's a lot that can go right. It's beautiful in that way. But there's a lot that can go wrong, too. And you cannot set a campaign and forget it. You can't just set this magic thing up, have an awesome whiteboard about it, put things into action, and walk away for six months and then feel good about yourself. Like, that is not how this works. <coughs> you need a true partner that's going to bring you proactive suggestions. Somebody who's going to say, you know what, we screwed this up. You know, I say this, this is what's happening, we've got to do this. Like, that's what a true business partner is going to do for you. And why are we going to do that? Because it's going to lead to more of these. And what does that mean to you? Well, I know that every form that's submitted on that website is worth $1,516 to you. And I know that it's going to take me 141 of those to turn back a return on your investment. That's the kind of partner you need. And that's the kind of true business partner that's going to help you Turn your branding campaign into an uh, expense on your sheet, uh, an expense and a cost to you, an actual investment that makes you money. So hopefully today, you can now understand a little bit of how we go about building a campaign in terms of understanding the landscape, understanding why your website exists, what you're trying to accomplish, where you're going after people, who the people are, what device they're on, what ad type to put in front of them, how to monitor your campaign, and how to help or how to select a partner to help you do this stuff and navigate these waters generate a return from this ambiguous branding campaign that you've developed. So thank you very much. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy and I'll be sticking around. I don't know what time it is, but hopefully I've been near my 20 minutes. So uh, thank you very much.